Alright. Alright, again, good morning. Job chapter 38 is where we're at. And Brother Mike called and couldn't be here, so we're going to try to cover this. As I mentioned, uh, probably appropriate for the times we're living in, in terms of the, the, in your quarterly, the title it is a message from the Lord. I titled it, Job's Prayers Are Answered. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't really what he wanted. So that's kind of where we're looking at. The one thing that I always, anytime I get to these two chapters, or well, actually through 41, I think, but the last couple chapters, <clears throat> all I can think about is Sinbad on the seven seas <laughs> when they're fighting those sea monsters and the, 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 all the, the, the fighting going on and everything. That sounds what this is. That's, that's what I think of. That's probably not... That's probably more than you wanted to know. But anyway, um, in 38, we go back to the beginning, I guess the beginning in terms of Job. You, we all know Satan has afflicted Job. Satan, the, the, the result of sin, the, 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 the acts of things that go on, God didn't create pain. God didn't create evil. God didn't create sickness. And in fact, he proves that in Revelation when he says he's going to take, he's, going to, he's already had victory over it. He's just going to give us victory over it for those that will accept him. So that's not the case, but Job doesn't, hadn't seen that. You gotta, I think Job was written, I think Job lived before a lot of the, the things happened, before, Mo, in, before Abraham even possibly. That is the oldest book in the Bible. So we've got things, maybe even before the flood. So we've got all these <clears throat> things happening and even at that time people knew God I mean you can go back to he wasn't before Adam but he was you know he was early on and so we have this thing going and Job has been afflicted has been in, in his life so much that he wants to die he knows God but he wants to die his wealth has been taken all of his his prestige his position where he was in terms of the world, everything that he had accumulated and worked for and got for himself, there was, God had blessed him in those areas and it, that was all gone. His family, gone. Uh, even his health, where he was in pain and literally wanted to die. I don't, I, this, this stuff going around there, some folks get it, it's not a big deal, some not get it and, and I, you know, it's one of those things, you're scared you're gonna die and you're scared you're not kind of thing you know that that's he he would i can't fathom that but even in knowing god he he knew god didn't cause it he had confidence in god we can see that even when his wife and his support group is up is turning on him he had confidence in god he didn't curse god but he sure complained to him a little bit and i think we could probably all relate to that let's I've been doing it all weekend. I don't just, just with everything going on and, and I focus too much on, on the world instead of on the Lord and on uh, the world instead of the word. And so I end up, I get, I get all tensed up and I think, what, what's going to happen? What are we going to do now? How am I going to handle this? And, and I know God's out there and I, I, I'm not, I can't imagine what Job was feeling, but he certainly did ask some questions. And I've said before in talking about Job, there's nothing wrong with asking God. There's nothing wrong in, in seeking the counsel and wisdom and protection and love and mercy and grace of God and wanting answers as long as we recognize who we are and who God is. And I think maybe that was, at least from my understanding of these few chapters, that was where Job was lacking. Now he didn't have 8,000 years of history and the entire word of God to go back to. All he had was what God had done for him. Like I said, it's, he was living in a different time and a different look. He didn't have the spirit. He didn't have, he didn't go to church every Sunday. Uh, in fact, the way we read this here, there was certainly some, just like Adam and, and Seth and some of that bunch, Enoch and some of those, they were aware of God. They knew God. They had faith in God, but it was, it wasn't different, but it was, Certainly not, they didn't have the availability and accountability that, or availability that we have. So he's just, he, he's seeing what's happening and in a day, all of it's gone. And God, I, I want to know what's, what's, what's happening. He didn't know Satan had been to God. That's something I think we have to keep in mind. We get the, we get the big perspective. We get the big picture. 
God starts out in Job saying this is it. Job didn't know that. He just he gets up one morning and everything he's worked for is falling apart. And by the end of the day, he has nothing. Uh, our security is, let me do it this way. Salvation is not the result of a well-made argument leading to a proper conclusion. Remember his wife and then his friends come and there's been arguments about what the friends gave him good advice. Not basically they're saying, look, it's God. So you must have some sin in your life. You must have some problems. You need to get that straight and get that worked out. And even the one guy that's kind of, Elihu, I think, that's kind of on the fence about you need to talk to God about it. He's still not, they're still trying to place it in somehow where we can understand it. And... Job, that's what he's after is an explanation. I just got, I don't think he, I guess in my mind, he wasn't questioning God as much as complaining. And God, explain to me. You're, all these things happen, explain to me what's going on. Our security depends on God, not on ourselves, and not on our own understanding. So our salvation and our security, what, regardless of what's going on in the world, is dependent upon God. Job had to be reminded of that. And in the midst of struggles, in the, in the middle of a trial or a plague or a pandemic or whatever the case may be, I know I need to be reminded of that. That whatever, whatever I think, I, I, I spent the last two days asking, I don't y'all may not know this, but my wife's pretty smart. So I sit down and talk to her and tell her things that I wouldn't tell anybody else. And then she gets mad because I don't agree with her. But that's why I ask her, because I don't always agree with her because she's got a better perspective than I do. And I've been struggling with this, of what we're supposed to do as Christians and how, as a pastor of a church and as a church, how we're supposed to respond and to react. And I've, I get to thinking about looking at the CDC guidelines or looking at what the governor said or looking at what this person said or this church is doing. And I forget that our salvation is in the Lord and our security is in the Lord. That doesn't mean that we're not supposed to act and do things in accordance with the world, we know the Bible, but that's where we that's where we start. That's where we have to focus. That's where we have to begin is with is with Jesus Christ, with God. And that's what Job in essence was doing, but he just he already had a plan in the back of his mind, I think. And we find that out when God gives him the answer that he's been seeking. So in chapter 38, verse 1, it, after all this has taken place, he's, he's lost everything. We get to chapter 138, and he asks God, he says, God, just tell me. Just give me an explanation. Then in verse 1 of 38, then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? God appears to Job. Now, I can't verify this, but I think it's the first time maybe that Job had seen a theophany, seen God in some form that man had. I can't, I don't know, it depends on where you believe Job was, but if you got Moses in the burning bush, you've got the children of Israel in the pillar of uh, cloud by day and fire by night, and you've got uh, Elijah seeing God, Elisha seeing God in the chariots, and maybe Elijah says something about a whisper. He hears God and sees God. So you've got these manifestations of God before Jesus came to earth, You've got these things going on. Uh, you've got Jacob wrestling. You know, y'all know God was a wrestler. <laughs> you know, you know he was the captain of an army. Abraham saw him as an angel and a man, an angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. But it seems that he came in a whirlwind, a massive amount of air, whether a tornado, a hurricane, a storm, whatever. But he, it was certainly Job knew who was speaking. And he's fixing to get an answer. And the first thing that comes when he gets the answer to his questions about God, tell me what's going on, his complaint, God says to him, who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Who is this that comes to me in ignorance and confusion? <laughs> who, 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 are, who is this that's asking questions that's just dark, muddy in the waters because you don't know what you're talking about? I feel like that a lot. But Job was reminded, and I'm often reminded of that as well. So he tells him this. He said, you want an answer? Gird up thy loins now like a man, for I will, for I will demand of thee an answer thou me. You want an answer, Job? Let, you get ready. Let me give you some questions, and I'm going to demand an answer from you. 
Remember, you're the one that's confused. You're the one that's muddy in the waters. So let me get things straight with you. I don't think God was being mean. I think he was just showing Job where he was. He was answering Job's question. He was answering Job's complaint. You ever got an answer to a prayer that you really didn't like? We usually don't accept it. I don't. I, just, I, I must not be praying right. I must, I must have not heard correctly. Because this is what I want and God didn't give it to me. So I'm going to pray a different way. I'm going to do something else. Well, the whirlwind showed up. The whirlwind showed up. So God answers with questions. According to your quarterly, I think he asked 77 <laughs> questions. How about that for a pop quiz? Remember those? <laughs> you, want, you want to complain to me? You want to fuss? Here's 77 questions. When you give me those answers, then we'll talk. They were probably rhetorical. They were intended to reveal Job's limits of understanding and reveal the majesty of who God really is. Job knew it, but he needed a different perspective. He needed, he needed to look at it in a different way. He needed to look at, see God in a different way. So he starts with questions and in the first, first through, through 38, let's see if that's, yeah. From verse four through 38, God asks questions about his control, about God's place and God's control over creation. Job, you want to know why things are happening and you need an explanation? Let me ask you some questions to see where you're at. So I, can, I know where you're at, so you'll know where you're at. And so he talks about creation. He asks him some questions about creation. In verses uh, 4 through 7 and verse 17 through 18, he asks questions about creation, about the, about the earth. Uh, who was thou when I laid the found, where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Job, where were you when creation happened? That's, that's the first question on the pop quiz. Where were you? Declare if you know, if you have the answer, tell me. Who has laid the foundations thereof? If thou knowest, put it out there. Let me know who it is. Where are the foundations fastened? How, how are things, how is it laying out there? How is the world, how is the earth going out there in space? How is the, how do you keep from flying off this thing and spinning around in outer space? You know, we've heard all these things. I told y'all before, the first time I learned the earth was spinning, I ran home. You think, talking about a different perspective? I learned in, bio, in science class that the earth spun on axis. And I thought, that's the coolest thing ever. That explains a lot. Now, I knew about God and understood. So I got a different project. I ran home, and when I started talking to mom and dad about it, I ran and looked out the front door because I thought I'd see the front yard and the backyard and the front yard. And the back yard. <laughs> you know why? Because I'm the center of the universe. <laughs> I didn't know it at the time, but that's, that's the way, that's really the way we are. Well, that's where Job was, and, and God gives him a different perspective. You weren't there when this happened. How does this all work? I think Isaiah said his thoughts, talking, speaking of God, that his thoughts are higher than our thoughts and his ways higher than our ways. So he asked all these questions about the earth and about the creation and formation. Then in verses 8 through 11 and in verse 16, he asked about the oceans. We've, we've had the question, you know, people, people talking about space this time you're going to the beach, seeing all the waves. How does the beach still be there? How do the, it just, the, the ocean's moving. How does it not empty? Or how does it, how is it even, how, how does it, how does that work? You know, and, and that's what he asked Job. And remember, Job, this wasn't, this wasn't last week. This was when there, I, I think it was when everything, there was just, there was earth. Job knew about his little place. There wasn't any need to go anywhere else. There wasn't any need to do anything else. God had provided everything he wanted. Uh, Let's find it out. Who shall shut up the sea with doors when it breaks forth? When I made the clouds a garment there from thickness darkens a swaddling lamp when it break upon it my decreed place and set bars and doors. I start the seas and stop them. How did, you, how did we get beaches? How, do you, how, do we, how does the water know where to stop? How does, it, how does that work out? Then he talks about light and darkness. The light and the source and the heat in verses 12 through 15 19 through 21. Hast thou commanded the morning since the days and caused the day spring or the dawn to know his place? Who determines the time and the place and the, 
and, and when it's light and when it's dark and how everything works in the universe. Your body, you, Job, you know, Job wasn't, he wasn't a lot different than us. He went to sleep. Some of y'all can, well, most of you in here can understand this more than others. My, my great grandpa, who I got to spend a little time with when I was a lot younger, he didn't, he didn't know what daylight savings time was. He got up when it's daylight, went to, went to bed when it's dark. That's just, who, decide, who decided that? God. That's the way we're made. He'd get up at 4.30 in the morning, fix breakfast, eat whatever he wanted to eat, and he'd work all day. When it got dark, he'd come in, maybe watch a baseball game, go to bed, or listen to a baseball game, <laughs> and go to bed. That's, who, 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 we're made that way, the light, the dark. Uh, verses 22 through 30, and through 30, and 34 through 38, he talks about the rain and the snow and how things operate and how that works out to help with the times. Uh, how the precipitation, I always get that, that's a hard word to say. He talks about snow. And remember, it's a different time. But Job, you see these things happening. You know that it, the seasons and all these things. Verses 31 through 33, and he mentions the stars. He talks about some constellations, I think, probably just to, at least from what I can gather, and I don't know a lot about them, but he talks about different things in the air, probably navigating. Maybe Job knew some things about where, you know, get the direction. He didn't have a compass, so he had to know north and had to know this, this way, with whether it was, I don't know what he called it, but I'm assuming he meant, I got to go that way to get to the river. I got to go that way to get to the creek. I got to go that way to get the desert, the mountains, or whatever. But he had a, had a way of knowing it, and the stars at night, how do they stay there? How do they determine that's, you, you can't reach them. You can't see them. You can't, you can't do anything with them, and yet they're there, and they're there for a purpose, and they're the same way every day. How does that, where's your place in all that, Job? And then before Job can answer, because we know the answers to all those, man's nothing, right? <laughs> we, I wasn't there. I don't know how it works. I can't, I don't have the, I can't under, I can, Science can explain it a little bit, the centripetal or centrifugal force and all the things about, but ultimately, we have nothing. We're dependent upon God to save us and to keep us, regardless of what the circumstances are going on. He's in control of all those circumstances. I'm sure as those questions were asking, Job was thinking, I, I'm worried about I'm worried about my wealth and God owns it all. I remember I was singing a song when I was a kid and I, I've hunted it before and, I, he, and he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. I know my, when my papa was, had some cows and cattle, they, they talked, that, that, was, that was what they sang because it, that was a, it's a status thing. Yeah, how many cattle do you got? How many head of cattle do you got? It was a status thing. God owns them all. We don't have, we don't, we don't have a plug. We're, we're dependent on him for everything. And sometimes we need to be reminded of that. Especially when it seems like things are out of control. Especially when it seems like the world has just completely gone off course and it's doing its own thing. Which is, to me, what it seems like right now. I'm guessing Gideon and Samson and Samuel and David and some of those probably thought the same thing. In verse through 30, end of 38, chapter 39, but he doesn't give Job a, ch a chance to answer. He starts talking about the creatures on the earth. Now we're getting a little, getting a little closer to home. Job, look around you. You don't control any of this. But now let's get a little. Let's let's talk about some of the things here. He talks about lions, ravens, uh, wild goats, wild donkeys, peacocks, horses, eagles, hawks, and did I mention unicorns? <laughs> I'm pretty sure that wasn't a white stallion with a glittery horn. Could have been. Maybe it'd been a rhinoceros, probably some kind of. From everything I can read and find out, it remembers a different time. Some kind of wild, what well, we would cattle, oxen, maybe a rhinoceros, but some kind of horned animal that had been later on is domesticated or used, but it was wild at the time. 
God talks about all those things and how, how they function and how they, those things, how those animals survive and work and the way that their, their, their existence goes. And it doesn't make sense. Job, you can't explain how this, the peacock, which it's the way it sounds like that, or some people say it was an ostrich, that you look at the science and the biology, or biology, is that the right word? The science of, 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 of an ostrich. There should not be any ostriches. The way they, the way they parent, the way that they leave their eggs and leave them, and they run around. And but he, God says, I, that's the way I made them. There's a purpose and plan for that. For the wild animals and for the lion and, and all these things, they have a purpose. And they fulfill that purpose in their own way, even though they don't even understand it. Uh, but God has made things that way. And even though it looks like it's out of control, and even though it looks like that, that shouldn't work, a mountain goat, and, you know, and a, all the... It does because God's got it in his hand. Uh, I had to, I, I think I've shared this with you before about our dogs at the house. We ended up with two, I got rid of all, all the dogs finally and we got two more just recently because <laughs> the kids wanted them. I get a call Thursday and uh, the, the stray that had come up, thank goodness it wasn't the one that, my daughter has adopted. It was it was a stray. It's come up been there a while. I haven't got attached to it. It won't even. It wouldn't even come up and talk. It wouldn't even come up. To, it wouldn't even let me pet it. Talk to me. Wouldn't even come let me pet it for. <laughs> guess it, Joe. I don't know. Could, could have, until about a week ago, and I finally the dog came up and I got to pet it. Got to mess with it a little bit. He's eating good, growing up. And Kurt kind of adopted him, so he was kind of taking care of him. Uh, Caitlin was feeding him. I went and got a collar for him Wednesday, I think. Friday, Friday morning? Was it Friday morning, Cheryl? Yeah. Friday morning? I get a phone call. Catherine's in a panic. Caitlin's in a panic. Stubby got run over. Aww. And he's still alive, and I had to pull him out of the road. Aww. She's freaking out. I told her, go get your brother. <laughs> Well, he goes out there, and they got him out of the road, and he, but he, he, he was, his back was all broke up. So what I'm, during all this travel planning purpose, I had to go home, and my son had to shoot the dog. I hadn't had that happen before. I ain't never shot one. I was going to, because I'm tight. I wasn't going to let somebody else do it. I wasn't going to pay somebody to do it. But he did it. And I had to have the conversation with my two grown kids, my youngest one, that our emotions, God gave us our emotions, God gave us a purpose and a plan and a reason, but truth always trumps our feelings. Mm -hmm. And the truth is that dog is not in heaven, that dog is fine, and that dog is much better off how we took care of it because he was hurting and he wasn't gonna live, wasn't gonna survive, and it's, he wasn't a person. Now, I know the world is kind of messed up. Some people don't think. I don't, I don't mean that to be negative. I'm just saying God has a plan and purpose. And he, he brings that out to us. And sometimes it's in difficult circumstances. And he told him about these creatures because ultimately God is talking to Job about your plan and your purpose and how I'm working in you to get what I need from you. God doesn't need us. He wants us to need him. So then, in chapter 40, after all this questions, or most of the questions, he says, all right, Job, hearing all these questions, I need your response. You want it, you ask me questions, I'm, I'm, you, you complain to me, there's my questions for you, now you respond. And the Bible says that he, tell, he comes to him pretty forceful in verse 2. The Lord answered Job. Shall he that contendeth with the Almighty instruct him? Job, you want to contend with me? Listen to these questions. You want to contend? What's your answer? Are you going to reprove me for the way, I'm, the way I'm handling things, the way I'm doing things? Answer. Let me know. Here, what, what do you, what's, your, what's your response to all that? Job's response was humility and silence. 
And not because he had to, but because he gained some perspective. Now, listen, he gained perspective in a 24-hour period of losing his family and his wealth, his position, and his friends. I guess it was a little longer than that because his friends were there for a while. I think seven days they sat with him didn't say nothing. So within a week, two weeks, he gains this perspective in all the mourning and in all the sorrow and in all the complaining about who God is. And he decides not to say anything. He declares himself a sinner, the vile, worthless, useless. He knows he hadn't done, he's, he's not done anything wrong. He's not been worshiping idols. In fact, he's not cursed God. But he declares himself, I know now, compared with the Almighty, I am a sinner. I'm undone. I, I can't save myself. I can't keep myself. I can't have my own security. And he determined to accept whatever God gave him, whatever God allowed him, because he knew it was God. Now that's the hard part. I know where I, I can see, okay, I, I can see where I'm at. I can see kind of my situation, but to accept that God is the authority and that even this pandemic or even this loss or even this sorrow or this pain is for me to bring him glory. It's for me to grow. It's for me to be closer to him because I'm nothing. This life, I'm not the center of the universe. God is. And other people need to know that. And he's given me the opportunity to share that. that you know, it's all problems become opportunities. That's the perspective. That's a really good quote if you're not having problems. <laughs> you know? But if you're having problems, to look at them as opportunities requires hearing from God and sometimes it requires standing in presence of God sometimes it requires God contending and reproving us even when we hadn't done anything wrong because he doesn't want it to get worse he wants it to get better he wants us to grow and move toward him in verses 6 and 7 he asks Job some more questions when Job comes to this place then he begins to ask him questions pertinent to Job and his relationship, and God and Job's relationship. And he starts the same way as before, verse 6 and 7. He says, then answered the Lord. Job says, once I have spoken, but I will not answer, yea, twice, but I will proceed no further. Job, I'm, 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 I realize that now. And then God answers from the whirlwind again, says, gird up your loins. I will demand of thee and clear them. Job, now you're to the point you can get the lesson. This was just, this wasn't, all that wasn't the answer to your prayer. All that was getting you ready to receive the answer. Now here's the answer to your prayer. And he starts asking him again. And this is where he starts talking about all the weird stuff. He talks about behemoths and leviathans. <laughs> and I'm just going to, his challenge is to Job. Job knew what these things were. I don't know, and, and you can spiritualize it, you can do all kinds of stuff with it, but bottom line is, there was some, whether it was, whether the, the behemoth was an elephant or a hippopotamus or a dinosaur, doesn't really matter. Whatever you want to believe about it, I don't, it doesn't make any difference. Job knew what it was. And whether the Leviathan is a sea serpent, the Loch Ness monster, or a dinosaur, or a crocodile, or some symbol of the dragon Satan himself. Certainly that application could go to us. I don't know what interpretation you want to place on that. But again, it doesn't matter as long as we're answering as God gives us the question and recognizing God is comparing man to God's creation to the creator. In both cases, Leviathan and Behemoth, he's saying, look, he gives a description of how strong and fierce and, 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 and powerful and what they're capable of. And he, it kind of is like the majesty of God, something that we, it's, it's a picture. 
I think he gives Job the picture. He says, Job, you can't understand. You're listening to me out of a whirlwind. But look at this animal. And see how it operates. I made it, but see how it is compared to mankind. You can't tame it. You can't domesticate it. You can't control it. You can't make it a pet. You can't do any of these things. You're compared to God. That's, you're, that's what you're trying to do in your complaint. Just let it be what God wants it to be. With the Leviathan, it's more of a conflict. He's comparing and says, look, this, this, this thing is fierce and powerful. It's got uh, uh, all these, all the, I hadn't even, I, you can go back and read through it. It talks about its description and how sharp the teeth are, the damage that it can do. Man, how, you're going you're gonna to catch it? You're going to put a hook in its mouth and pull it out of the water and do something with it? It's more powerful than that. You need me to overcome that. I made it. That, that greatness. And he, and, that's, and he tells it because he comes to the conclusion. And then when he comes to the end of chapter 41, I think. He says, verse 34, he beholdeth all high things. He is a king over all the children of pride. St still describing this Leviathan. What he's coming to is this. Regardless of what you think about the time or what these animals were, and people will try to get, they, they, I've heard people use these verses to get some weird ideas. In my mind, I, but I, I can't, you're going to have to find, you're going to have to decide for yourself. But the bottom line is this. God forced Job, because Job wouldn't do it on his own, to get a heavenly perspective of what's going on in the world. He made him come closer to God. He came to Job and drew Job in to see the big picture. And once Job recognized it, and, and all the things that happened in his sorrow and grief and pain and loss and all the terrible things that was going on, when he got enough, when, when God had come to the 70th of the 77 questions and he said, okay, what's your response? Job's response was repentance. He changed. He didn't have the attitude he had before. He didn't have the questions he had before. He didn't have the complaints he had before. He still had the problems. Maybe it was just because he knew God was there. And here's the kicker. God never told Job why it was happening. He didn't give him the explanation. He could have said, Job, look, you're a pretty good fellow. I knew I could count on you. You've been, you, you stayed with me. And Satan come over here and he, he's trying to make an example of the world. He think, so I'm trying to teach him something. I, I, need, I need an example to show to Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church in the 21st century. So you're it. I, I know it's tough, but I'm promising you I'm going to take care of things. He could have done that. I would like to think if God told me that, I would be able to handle the plague better. Probably not, but I would, you know, at least I've got an explanation. But the very one of the first verses in your quarterlies, or first line of your course, is this. He never gave Job that explanation because Job didn't need an explanation. He needed to accept God's will and accept who God was. An explanation wasn't going to change that. Now, we, I think next week we're going to find out God's response to Job's response. Which kind of ends the story, which is a little better. He still didn't get an explanation. So the question becomes, have we ever complained to God? Have you ever just had something thought, God, I need to know more about this? I have. And when God responded, it wasn't always like I wanted. But hopefully, we grow from those things because we accept what God is doing, knowing who he is. And when we get to that point, we can't help but just bow before him and worship him and be thankful for what we do have to understand that we have him because he allowed his grace.
It, it, it ought to change us. Even as his children, it ought to change us every day to recognize that he's in charge and he's in control. All right. I didn't have as many good mic stories, but that'll be. <laughs> Questions? All right. I'm going to run over there and change hats. <laughs> Thank y'all. Yeah. Stop against it. Please. One on the bottom.